You're listening to Inclusive AF with Jackie Clayton and Katie Van Horn. Hello, hello. Uh, this is Katie Van Horn. And this is Jackie Clayton. And this is the Inclusive AF podcast. Jackie's working yes. on her intro. It's going to... For a year and a half now. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, let's see. How long has it been now? Um, yeah. It's working out. It's working out perfectly. Um, so welcome one and all. We have a special guest with us today, Nancy Murphy. Um, and we're going to have a, a hopefully fun conversation and learn a little bit and share a little bit and as we usually do. So Nancy, I'm going to turn it over to you. I would love for you to share a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your identity, and then we'll uh, jump in. Well, I guess I should say I'm Nancy Murphy. <laughs> yes. See? Love you it. I'm learning. Memo. Yeah. I'm learning. <laughs> so I am a straight white woman originally from the Midwest who spent 16 years in Catholic school. So that should tell you a lot about what I'm still recovering from. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. I've been in the DC area about 28 years. So as much as my uh, parents refuse to believe it, this is really home for me now. And I am in my early 50s, and I've spent the last 30 years of my career working in private industry, nonprofits, philanthropy, and local and federal government. So I'm one of those kind of tri-sector athletes. I've worked in every industry and can kind of tell you a little bit about how to translate, you know, across those sectors and what the similarities are, which there really are more of than there are differences. And I started CSR Communications a little over a decade ago to really help organizations make change that sticks. So that's a little bit about me. Awesome. Very cool. Well, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, Would love to hear a little bit about, you know, with the company that you have, Tell us a little bit about what you're doing around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yeah, so I don't consider us diversity, equity, inclusion experts by any means, but we are organizational change experts. And most of what we're trying to do around DEI in organizations is get them to change to be more diverse, equitable, inclusive. And so last September, we released the first paper in our Intrapreneur's Insight series, which was called Beyond Proclamations and Positions to Persistent Practice. And it's really some actionable insights about what it takes to lead change around these topics inside organizations. I like that. I I think, you know, that's one of the things that, and I know Jackie and I have talked about this from a change management perspective, the, the impact of this work, it isn't a, Hey, you can flip the switch and everything is great. And, you know, it's changes, you know, changes hard. And especially when you're, you know, talking about some of these topics. So, um, would love to hear some of the insights that you had from that research. Yeah. Well, so let me share two based on the sentence you just shared with us, right? <laughs> Which is um, number one, it, grand gestures are often what we hear around this topic, right? Since mid 2020, how many times have we read grand proclamations or declarations of, you know, 50% of our senior leadership are going to be people of color by 2025, or we're investing $100 million in Black-led nonprofits and businesses in our community, or, you know, whatever it is. And so those grand gestures are nice, but they're not enough to make change stick, right? We need the folks I call intrapreneurs, the internal change agents, who are the unsung heroes of organizational change. They're gonna come in behind and lead the small strategic actions every day that make those proclamations real, right? So so that's one insight that we learned. And when we have those grand gestures, what oftentimes happens is there's an expectation that's set, 
right? Oh, well, this organization's made this big commitment to diversity. Awesome. I want to go work there. They just hired their first chief diversity offer. Excellent officer. That, that must be such a great place to work. And we get inside the organization and the experience is different. So I often talk about the expectation experience gap. Mm -hmm. And when that gap is too big, <laughs> right? You, then you erode trust, you have low morale, you have a hard time with retention. Eventually the word gets out, you have a hard time with recruitment. You might have um, that gap, not just with employees, but also with you know, partners, donors, customers, vendors, you know, anyone who's, who's read about your grand gesture and now they have an expectation of what it's going to be like to work with you and they find out it's different. So those are just a couple of the insights. I'm happy to, to share more because there were many nuggets that came out of there. So let's take it whatever direction you want to go next. No, I love that. I think it's so, it's, um, it is very telling because I like I recently started a new role and it's like, oh, well, well, we haven't seen anything for this or this. And I'm like, oh, did you notice that we changed this process, that we implemented this plan? Like all of that leads to the change. And, and when anytime you start a new role, you kind of have to test to see what the appetite is mm, for change yeah. so that you can build. Because, I mean, I, I you know, I always people say, Oh, well, you can't do everything immediately. It's like, well, you could, but <laughs> you're, it's lonely. <laughs> it's yeah. going to be lonely. Yeah. Um, and there's an absorptive capacity for change, right? So if you try to do everything at once, you're like the sponge is going to be full and people just aren't literally, will, they will not be able to take on, you know, the implementation or the doing of one more thing at some point. So it's like, how do you balance that sense of urgency, which we all have around this work, right? With the absorptive capacity for change. Well, and I think there's so it's, it's the unfortunate part is we, we, if we learned anything starting in 2020 is that we have to have at least some space for, or it could go this way, <laughs> right? Yeah. Or not. Like we, we have to give our mental self, our mental space to pivot as, as needed. And I think I, I wanted to see how you, um, what's been your experience more recently. I've noticed with organizations are like, oh, you said we couldn't work at home and then boom, look, pandemic, then all of a sudden we can work at home. So now I need you to, you know, give me a hair extension benefit. Like, there's all these things that people are just expecting. And I'm wondering what has been, have you noticed any sentiment, especially in this like remote hybrid, like workforce? Has we seen a difference in people's appetite for change management? Well, so one thing, and, and you and, and Katie both use the term change management. And so I sort of bristle when I hear that. So before I answer your question, let me just sort of put my, my stake in the ground for change leadership, right? Because, you know, you've both alluded a little bit to, you know, the, the emotional messiness of particularly the diversity, equity, and inclusion work, right? It can be very personal for people. And so what I think change management as a term, as a concept, where I think that is actually a disservice for us to think about it that way, is it sort of implies that like it's a very scientific, predictable, logical, linear thing, right? And there are these 12 steps. And if you're, and then you're in this stage for this many weeks, and then you move on to the next stage, and it's all very controllable. And unfortunately, I guess, organizations are made up of people. And humans are very messy emotional beings, you know? So when we, when we use the term change management, it sort of implies that it's controllable. And so I feel like it, it does a, a disservice. And if we can instead say change leadership, which appreciates the emotional, the psychological triggers that make change hard, the need to really lead people through this rather than sort of implement checklists and processes and protocols, right? 
So I think that's an important distinction for us to think about. And then if we put that understanding in the context of the pandemic and the work from home and the hybrid and the virtual, and, you know, I think we're seeing a lot of different things when it comes to how people are reacting and responding to change. In some ways, it's been great for people who are those intrapreneurs, those people leading change from within, because, well, when the status quo is totally blown open, right? Like when everything is in upheaval, things that used to seem impossible, like you referenced, Jackie, are suddenly totally possible. As a matter of fact, we're already doing them. <laughs> what else might we throw out the window, right? Like we never thought we could do this. Well, what makes us think we can't do that now, right? Like if we never thought we could have on a dime, like in a hot second, send 90% of our workforce to work from home. Well, why do we think we can't do something else that now seems impossible, but probably is possible? So that's definitely one thing. At the same time, I mentioned that absorptive capacity, right? So sometimes there's so much change that's been forced on people trying to then put proactive change on top of that reactive change, people just, they just sort of like fall apart because it's too much. It's just too much. The emotion, the stress, um, all of those psychological triggers where we feel threats to our, and think about this in the context of diversity, equity, inclusion, and in the context of the pandemic, right? When we feel threats to our status, to certainty, to autonomy, to relatedness, and to fairness, we have that fight, flight, or freeze response. And so there's been a lot of perceived and real threats to those things in the last two years. And so in a lot of ways, people are freaking out and it's kind of hard to put some other change, even if it's good and necessary and right on top of it. I think I've been in the fight status since like sixth grade. I'm just like constantly, <laughs> mm -hmm. it, always ready. I'm trying always to be ready. But I think, I think you you bring up a, a good point. I saw something on the Wall Street Journal, and they were talking about, I forgot the name of it, but they were, um, it was on YouTube, talking about how we're mourning, yes. um, things that we don't know, like what we missed, even though it's not like a real thing. Like we're missing the parties that we had or the relationships that we haven't built. And and I think I'm starting to see that more in the office of some people have gotten to this point and they're like, I have to go back into the office. Like they just are, are like, it's, it, is, it is too much. Um, but I like that sponge analogy. I'm gonna write that down. Where well, it's like and you just you can't know, absorb anymore. Yeah. And to your point, I think we we now see very clearly um, like the interconnectedness of work from home requirement or work from home option and the the equity impact. Right. Mm -hmm. So not everyone has space that's appropriate or even, you know, comfortable in their homes to work. <laughs> Not everyone has, you know, quiet or they're juggling all the, you know, we know the early impacts on women in particular with juggling homeschooling response school, uh, you know, learning from home responsibilities and other family responsibilities and caregiving and, and all of that. And now, you know, we're also seeing concerns around, okay, so you're giving people the option now to come back into the office part-time, full-time, to continue to work from home part-time, full-time there, you know, and we're seeing lots of crazy things around the various policies of that. But we know there could also be equity impacts when it comes to who comes back in the office and who doesn't and, and all the implications there. So, you know, sometimes we, we like to think these are completely siloed, separate sort of sphere uh, lanes of organizational change but they're not right. They're all interconnected and, and intertwined. Absolutely. One of our, our good friends, Tara Robertson came on and she just recently published a HBR article with one of her um, colleagues. And it was around like the impact of the, mm. 
equity of not being present in the office, not being physically there and, and how that can damage your promotion capabilities or different things like that, that historically it has been who you're seeing every day, who you're, you know, going out and having cocktails with, whatever it might be. It's the, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the, gets the, mm-hmm. uh, money. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, that it is interesting. And, um, I would love for you to talk a little bit about, you know, as you're talking about changed leadership, what should organizations be thinking about? What should they be doing proactively as they're thinking about their own journey around across, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, what are steps that you think companies should take pre kind of starting the project? And then also kind of as they're in it. Well, I appreciate that for many, this work will be perhaps a series of projects. And again, I'll go back to the change management versus change leadership. One of the findings from the paper, and this is this is definitely resonates with my own experience of, in all sorts of organizational change. It is a journey, right? That was the metaphor you just referenced there. So to think about it like a, a project almost sort of undermines the amount of effort and the patience, right? The patience and the persistence that we need to have. So I would say, first and foremost, one of the things that, that I teach all the time is how to become a credible leader of change. So if you're that primary champion, if you're that chief diversity officer, if you're the chief human resource officer who's leading this effort, are you a credible leader of change? And part of that is communicating clearly the effort and the time frame, right? So we go back to that expectation experience gap. If you've made a bold proclamation about your commitment in this space, but you haven't at the same time clearly communicated, this isn't a 12 week sprint on a project and then we're done, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Then that, that expectation experience gap is gonna be huge. But if you say, this is a journey, our first step is gonna take us here, but we might be on this journey for 10 years. You know, We didn't get here in a 12 week sprint. <laughs> mm-hmm. We know this is hundreds of years of you know, stuff. So let's not pretend that even though we all feel the sense of urgency, let's not pretend, as you said, Jackie, we flip the switch and it's over. So understanding what it means to be a credible leader of change, building that trust. And part of that trust is being open and honest about what it's going to take to do that. Um, You know, one of the other things is paying attention to where the, the actions and the initiatives and the projects that you're putting in place, where are they placing the burden for change in the wrong place, right? So we think about mentoring programs, for example, which is a classic, um, initiative in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Well, mentoring programs are basically about teaching the, the, those of us who may not be in the majority or, you know, in the positions of power in the organization, it's teaching us how to fit in or how to make it within the culture and the power structures that exist versus changing the culture and the structure so that everyone you know, feels like they can be themselves, they belong, all of that, that they have the same opportunities and and all of that. And so it doesn't have to be either or, (laughs) it can be both and, but let's, let's really pay attention to where are we placing the burden for change in this effort. And then, you know, one of the other things that I think trips folks up all the time And this is true in all sorts of types of organizational change. I think it can be especially true when we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion is um, we fail to operate more like Indiana Jones. So (laughs) what do I mean by that? Change leaders need to go on a quest, an archeological dig to find the artifacts all the little things we leave behind as we move forward with change that tell us who and what matters, uh, what really matters, who and what we value and how things really get done around here. 
And a lot of times those things conflict with the change we want. And these are sometimes obvious things on the surface. Sometimes they're more subtle. One example I give all the time is um, an, a nonprofit we worked with that was struggling to retain women leaders. And they started a mentoring program and they formed a gender council to advise the CEO, but nothing worked. And so we came in and brought our uh, proprietary excavation process in to sort of look for those artifacts. And just a couple that we unearthed were 7.30 a.m. leaders meetings and shout outs at the start of every staff meeting that all sounded something like, Huge thanks to Jackie and her entire team for working around the clock last week on that big proposal. Made all the difference, really appreciate you. Now, when I share these examples with men, a lot of times they're like, well, so they were giving praise to people and you're telling me that's a bad thing? I'm like, well, <laughs> no, it's a subtle signal, right? That no, you can give me a mentor and tell me all the things I need to do so I can get promoted. But if the subtle signals I'm getting are what really matters around here are having no boundaries, right? And, and you, it's impossible to fulfill family obligations and fulfill work expectations. So I'm just going to leave rather than getting, you know, uh, promoted or staying in a position when I get to a certain level. Now, fixing those things, this is the best part. Fixing those things didn't cost a dime right? <laughs> or require any special authority. So going on that quest to find the artifacts that might be in conflict with the change you want is really important because when we don't unearth them and do anything about them, it can erode trust, right? Well, you say you want more women in leadership positions, but you basically make it impossible for us to do that. So we don't believe you or it creates too much friction, right? Like you're making it too hard for me to do the thing you're asking me to do. Like you're telling me that you want to see a more diverse pipeline, uh, a more diverse pool of candidates for a job in a big law firm. At the same time, you're telling me we only recruit from Yale and Harvard, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? That's an artifact. Why do you believe those are the only places you can get top talent? <laughs> And we know what their classes look, their graduating classes look like. So you're making it too hard for me to do the thing that I want to do too much friction. I can't do it. Right. So we got to go on that quest for those artifacts. Love it. I'm going to get a whip and a leather hat. I'm fully <laughs> Indiana Jones the whole time. Embrace thing. it, Jackie. Embrace it. I totally do. Oh, my God, too. <laughs> um, I feel like that's going to be on like a LinkedIn recording this week, actually. Like it's happening. I can feel it. I can feel it. But, um, but you're so right, though. I mean, I, we've been doing that. Like, like I, I've done this, that a lot with organizations, you know, and saying, you can't have you can't have it both ways. Like you can't have all of all of those things. You know, mm -hmm. um, you can't say that you want diversity and inclusion, and then say like we're not going to be a distributed team, and that we only hire in right. Boise, Idaho. Well, <laughs> that what's makes wrong with hard, Boise? It? <laughs> what's wrong I, with Boise? I don't. I listen. I'm, nothing's wrong with Boise. I'm sure it's a fine place with fine people for all of our listeners I'm just in Boise. Saying, we Jackie, love you. Jackie loves <laughs> Boise. Just to be clear. I love Boise. <laughs> However, like, well, that was always my big thing. I've worked, at, um, I work in a Seattle based company. It's my second mm -hmm. Seattle based company. Every Seattle based company said they were going to increase by 30%. And I'm like, there's literally five black people. So good luck. How are you going to do that? And it's really easy to say all of that and then be like, Oh, yeah, I can't do that. Well, you were never right. going to be able to do that. I mean, I don't math, but that's really easy math. And I think a <laughs> lot of people try, try to do that, you know, and, um, but I think we're seeing a lot. I am glad that you brought th that example of, of the dig, because there are a lot of organizations like that, especially now that people expect you to like be on round the clock. Right. <clears throat> yeah. And you know what else, Jackie, um, when it comes to like that recruitment example and your Boise or your Seattle, 
one of the other findings in our paper um, was, you know, of course, most people in our networks are like us, right? If, you know, that's just sort of the way the world works. And so when you have folks who are all, you know, middle-aged white women or older white men, and you're saying, who, you know, who, sh who would you recommend to join this advisory board or to take on that new project? Or, hey, we've got this open position. Like, who would you, who would you recommend? Like, think about who's in your network. Who comes top of mind, right? It's all top of mind. Well, the first five people probably look just like me in my network, right? Mm -hmm. Who would be top of mind? So we developed this idea of middle of mind thinking. Sometimes it's only five more minutes. Take five more minutes and like dig down to the middle of your mind. <laughs> and when, when we do that, it slows us down a little. And, you know, research shows that when we slow down a little, that creates enough of the good friction that it can decrease the unconscious bias. And so, you know, more folks might come to mind than would who are more diverse uh, candidates than might come top of mind. So just another little like trick that we can teach people again, doesn't cost any money. Isn't that hard? It takes five more minutes, but it might just start to undo some of the natural top of mind thinking that happens. I love that idea. And I think it's something that it, it uh, like that, just breaking that cycle or kind of, you know, putting that quick interruption into people's brain of who else, who else yeah. isn't here? Who else have you not thought of? who else maybe hasn't raised their hand that should, or whatever it might be. And just having that quick kind of pattern interruption, whatever you want to call it. But I love that, you know, kind of middle of the mind and, and giving them an opportunity to, to dig a little bit deeper. Cause I think that's one that you don't do. And, and I mean, I think we all are very much guilty of this, where it is a, who are those, you know, who do you call when this happens or when that happens? And and what do they look like and, and what are their experiences or whatever it might be. And unless you, unless you're in this work or, you know, doing this work on a, a you know, daily basis, it is pretty homogenous to whoever or whatever you are. So that's awesome. Um, so what do you have coming up in 2022? What's exciting for you and your team in 2022? Well, we're starting to do a lot more of these archaeological digs with organizations as a way to really help them, you know, get over those obvious things and sometimes more subtle things that are stalling the change they want. So, and it's kind of a, you know, we were talking earlier about the psychological triggers that make this change hard, that get people's defenses up or the absorptive capacity. And it, this can bring in a little bit of levity in a positive, productive way that can really get people sort of out of their change fatigue, I think. Um, so that's one thing we're doing. We um, just finished hot off the presses from our designer today, as a matter of fact, our second Entrepreneur's Insight series paper, which is around nonprofit governance and the board bridging the board staff divide and a lot of similar themes around because what causes a big part of that board staff divide are what do our boards in nonprofit organizations look like and what do the staff and the people we serve look like. And oftentimes it's very different. Um, and then there are all the power dynamics and things that can go along with that and who's making decisions on things that impact people who don't look like them and, and things like that. So um, that's a great resource for folks who are doing this work in the nonprofit space. I think you'll find a lot of great insights there as well. And, um, you know, continuing to chug along with our Entrepreneurs Influence Lab. We've got um, a cohort of a nice mix of um, uh, non-philanthropy, uh, corporate and nonprofit sector leaders who are in a local government um, representative who are in that six month leadership program. It's all around change leadership. So we'll continue to enroll folks in that and just really my passion is giving these unsung heroes of, of organizational change, the tools, techniques, support, everything that they need to succeed. Because when they get frustrated and give up or fail, we all lose, right? 
folks mm -hmm. are leading important change that we need in the world. And so I want everyone to have what they need. So if someone, you, you have mentioned the word entrepreneur a few times and, um, tell us a little bit more about what that is and, and who, who is the person that should be raising their hand to say, I, I am that person and an organization. So intrapreneur are folks who bring entrepreneurial spirit <laughs> and innovation and sort of that disruptor mindset to change organizations from within. So they are the unsung heroes who are making the small strategic sustained action every day that makes organizational change stick. So who are the folks who should be raising their hands? I would say if you find yourself being one of those people who sees opportunity where others see only challenges and problems, <laughs> right? Sort of like entrepreneurs. If, but you believe in the power and the value of our existing institutions and you want to make them better, right? Rather than going out and sort of starting your own thing and maybe having your impact be this big at first and maybe it never scales. But imagine, you know, if you believe in the power of getting an organization that's already at scale, that has resources and reach and expertise and making that change, then, you know, we get the change we want in the world faster. So if you, if that's the way you want to have your impact in the world, if you are, um, open to change. And if you're the type of leader and leader really with small L leader, right? You can have formal authority or informal authority. You might have a position, a title of power, and you may not yet, but that's okay. You can still be an entrepreneur. If you have the characteristics of a credible change leader, if you are that growth mindset, that, um, open, curious, um, empathetic, compassionate, you know, willing to be wrong, willing to try things out and make mistakes and to not always have to be everybody's best friend, you know, cause sometimes when we're doing this work, we're, I don't say we're going to make enemies, but we're, anytime you challenge the status quo, <laughs> you're challenging someone else's status. And so, you know, you gotta be a little brave and be willing to do that work. Yeah, we don't have that problem. <laughs> Katie's face, I'm just cracking up because she's like, oh, but yeah, no. We had uh, that you do this work long enough, you get you have to break a couple eggs a lot along the way. <laughs> but but I, I will say this, I it it goes back to what you it's something that you mentioned earlier, Nancy, of like looking at who those folks are. Yep. Because I think you know uh, historically we have seen marginalized groups have to be the ones leading some of this work or expected to, to be the ones to raise their hands when it comes to this. And it, it is one of those things that like, how do you get other folks in on the conversation and engaged in the conversation and understanding that it takes all of us, it takes every single person to be a part of it, not just folks that are already carrying the burden of this. Um, and so it just, it, it's interesting, but I, I love that concept and I love, you know, just the idea of that. So the cohort that you have, if someone is interested in joining a future cohort, it sounds like this one is all already underway, but if someone is interested in joining a future cohort, what do they do? I would send folks to our website, which is csrcommunications.com. And there you can learn more about the lab. You can schedule an application call with me to see if it's a good fit to see, uh, you know, when we're going to be enrolling for our next group. Maybe if you've got a cadre of change champions already inside your organization, maybe you want to bring a custom lab there so that we're, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you don't have to go it alone. <laughs> One of the mistakes many entrepreneurs make, let's get that group of 10 or 12 or however many it is change champions and let's do the work together in your organization. So you're not the only one who's, you know, having to carry that burden. Um, you can also download the entrepreneurs insight papers that I mentioned there on the website. And if folks have found anything useful today, that which I hope they have, um, they can go to csrcommunications.com forward slash weekly and sign up for ingenious, 
which are actionable gems for influential entrepreneurs. And every week you'll get something that is consumable in two minutes or less. That's an actionable nugget that you can apply to the problem of the hour. Awesome. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we like to do at the, the end of each episode, and I I've been taking notes and I have a, a I have a few, so this always happens where <laughs> I, I ask the question of what's the one thing that you want folks to take? Yeah. Only one. No, I'm just I, we, we try to keep it to only one Jackie and I never actually do. Um, so, but I like to just pretend that we do. Um, so if there's one thing you want to make sure that folks heard from you today, one thing that you want to make sure kind of, uh, lands with folks, what is that? That starting change with grand gestures can be easy but it's the small strategic sustained action, right? Over time that makes change stick. So let's even out the balance of the grand gestures and the small strategic sustained action. I love that. I mean, I could go buy a Peloton and that would be my grand gesture, but if I don't actually get on it every day, it's not really going to do much for me. So I, I'm the queen of grand gestures when it comes to working out. I'm really good at that. Um, but it, it applies, it applies. So, uh, Jackie Clayton. Yes. What you got? I love this Nancy Murphy. That yeah. is number one. I'm just like, <laughs> I was so sad. I knew you were going to start asking for the one question and I just want to talk to Nancy Murphy. Um, <laughs> well, let's make that happen again soon, Jackie. <laughs> Family note, I'm signing up for my nuggets. Um, but uh, I did appreciate just the, the of being an entrepreneur um, and understanding what that is. And I think I think that's kind of a persona that we don't always look at in our hiring decisions. And I think, mm-hmm. especially if you're want to work for one of those companies that strives to make change, that's a really mm-hmm. important. Um, personality type. So I, I'm kind of taking that away. And I don't know, I'm just like intrigued. I'm intrigued. <laughs> I love that's it. Like the best response, right? Where it's like, I want to know more. Yeah, that's good. You did good, Nancy. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Thank you. <laughs> I feel like you just got everything, but I don't, I feel like I do need to put on my leather hat and the whip and the vest. <laughs> and start digging. I do. This this uh, costume is changing. It's evolving into something I added that a we're vest. prepared for. In a for. second, it'll be like boots. <laughs> I need to go to the mall. <laughs> if we could just wrap this up, I need to go to Amazon. And yeah, I need my outfit. black yeah, pet leather knee high boots. I didn't say yeah. that. Girl. Yeah, you did. I heard it, <laughs> Nancy. Nancy, you heard it too, right? Is you this a family it. friendly podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Some families. <laughs> Very true. Very true. Um, so I, I, the, the two that I wrote down the, you know, change leadership versus change management. I just think I love that, that concept and that idea. And then I also, the middle of your mind, um, you know, I have done an exercise, um, that is it, kind of a similar, it's, you know, who are your top 10 or, you know, your trusted 10. Mm, and that's yeah. that, you know, who are the 10 people yeah. that you would write down that you would trust to take on a project or whatever it might be. And then actually writing down some of their characteristics, so, you know, mm-hmm. some pieces of their identity and you do start to see a pattern. And it is interesting because it's oof, you know, it, oh, they're a lot like me and, and maybe I should expand that circle. And so I love that concept of the middle of the mind. Um, just taking that extra beat to say, who else, you know, who have you not thought of already? So that, that was really interesting. So um, Nancy, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, We truly appreciate it. And um, you know, Nancy's already shared how you can get a hold of her, all those good things. And, you know, looking to her cohort, we have a lot of nonprofits that listen to us. I work with quite a few nonprofits. And so we have a lot of folks from nonprofits that are listening. And so I think this is a a great space to, to learn a little bit more about the the work that you're doing. So thank you for sharing. Um, This is Katie Van Horn. And this is Jackie Clayton. (laughs) That was pretty good. (laughs) I like that one. (laughs) <laughs> oh my God. So it's never going to end people save me. Um, so this is the inclusive AF podcast. Bye-bye. Bye.